Kidding that I'm using four different books, but you don't have to worry about none of them except for your own text. Uh, I use the other books as supplement to our discussions. For instance, this is not in your book, textbook, which basically future value factors, we call this, it's a table. You see, in many of the financial institutions, especially banking system, if you're talking to, a, I don't know, loan officer or any banker about, hey, I want to know uh, how much I'm going to have in this investment, what's future value of my investment, and so forth, so on, they don't sit down and calculate the way that you do it. I mean, they could, they should, be, uh, should have the ability to do it, but they go and look at the table, much, much easier for them. So what is this table? We have two tables. One is called future value factors. The other one is called what? Present value factors. We're going to take a look at both, both of them. So what this table is basically showing you, one dollar, how much one dollar worth with the different interest rates with the different years. Obviously, this table for the bankers is all these percentages, meaning that 1, 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, and all these, they have those abilities. But for now, for to just give you the sample, if you invest $1 with 1% interest, of the first year is going to give you $1 and uh, 0 0.10, 0 0.010. Basically, is one tenth of a cent, uh, if I'm, or, or yeah, one tenth of a cent. And then the goals grows for five years, six years, of course, grows. At the end of ten years, with one percent, your dollar is going to be dollar ten, dollar one dollar and ten cent. However, you go to the different years, and you're going to see for your one dollar in thirty years, with ten percent interest, becomes seventeen dollars. Now, obviously, he is going to say, well, 17 is not. But imagine if your, your initial investment is that $1 was what? Let's say 1000 or 10000 or $1 million. You're going to have $17 million at the end. So they use this table. That's an easy way to, or reference, if you will, for all these uh, future value calculations. Now, Second one is this, which is, like I said, present value factor. It gives you the present value of your future income or cash flow. For instance, if you have $1, the uh, present value of that $1, if, if you're receiving this $1 at the end of the year, at the beginning of the year, the value of this is only 99 cents. Your one dollar, one year from now, uh, if you receive that one dollar for one year from now with five percent, today's value of the one dollar one year from now with five percent is nine uh, point nine five, ninety five cent. <clears throat> your one, your one dollar, if you receive that one dollar with ten percent, I'm sorry, uh, with one percent, ten years from now. The value of it today is only 90 cent or 91 cent. If you look at this, then you let's say your one dollar that you're going to be receiving 30 years from now with 10 percent interest is only what um, five cent or six cent, 5.7 cent. Okay, so that table is again used as a reference to calculate the future value and present value. Okay, since I'm here, I'm gonna also share you, uh, with you something. Future value also has a simple way of calculation, meaning that uh, some people use this equation and it's kind of accurate between certain uh, threshold. What they do is they say, okay, I wanna figure out the present value of let's say $100 I'm sorry, I want to find out the uh, future value of $100 in um, 30 years 
with 10% interest. Okay. We did all those calculations earlier. But you could use this to say future value of $100 is time E. What is E? E is this number. Power of interest times the number of the years. You're going to give me the answer. Okay. Now, I'm going to give you a simple one. You do it, see if uh, you, 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 uh, you, you could uh, easily see how it is. Let's say again $100. What's the future value of $100 after two years with 10% interest? See if you could do it. Two years, I guess I said. Yeah, two years. <coughs> oh, professor, yes. For the uh, exponent, is that I times N? Yes. Inter okay. Interest times number of the years. So in this case, we'll do 20. Oh. This method uh, raises the price, or I suppose the payout a little bit. I'm not sure I understand what you're saying. Uh, so the it, it increases the future value 
by a little bit because this is like the continuous compound. And, and like I said, it's four tons, uh, in, in certain threshold and certain uh, ranges, this is accurate. Beyond that, it's not as accurate. because of exactly what you're saying. Yeah. This is the context that he was discovered in. Mm -hmm. It applies to lots of things. Okay, everybody come up with 122, right? Yes? No? No, I have, how do we do that? Okay, this I times N. What is I? Two. I is not two. I is what? 10% we said, right? Okay. And N is what? Two. Two, two times 10% is 20%. Right. Okay? So, so this power of point two, two, zero, it would be uh, point one, one to, uh, well, point one two, two. Yeah, I just want to know how to Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, the, the calculator. Okay. Uh, Here you go, folks. So first, you're going to raise it to two times point one. So yeah, because the calculator is like. Yeah, uh, uh, follow me. Ten. Okay, point ten. Point ten. That's ten percent, right? Times two equals to what? Point two zero. That's your power right there. Okay. So take this 2.71828, okay? And square root it with by 0 0.20. How do you square root that? Enter this 2.71828, go to y uh, x on top of it, make power sign. Push that, right? And then, into what? Point two zero equal to what? You see that? It's what? One point two two. Multiply what? With hundred. That's your present value. Thank you. It's hundred and twenty-two point fourteen. Got it? As um, Charles said, this is not very accurate, as I mentioned earlier. This is kind of easy way of doing certain calculation. Here's another example. 10,000. Your grandmother wants to put 10,000 in a saving account. How much money would she have at the end of five years if the bank pays 5% annual interest? Compounded continuously. In this particular uh, is the condition for using this uh, formula that is continuing, uh, actually compounding continuously. It has to compound continuously to give you that. So you take the 110,000 and you uh, enter that 2.71828, which is the E. Power of 0.05, which is your interest rate, multiplied by how many years? Five years. So five times 0 0.05 is? 0.25? Yes, 0.25. So enter 2.71828, power of 0.25, which would be 1.284. Multiply that with 10,000. She's going to have $12,840 at the end of five years if the account pays her 5%. This is a simpler way to plug it in than to uh, punch in 2.71828 every time. There's one? There's an easier way than having to punch in. Okay, what is easier way? So there's a button on here for e to the power of x. Oh yeah, okay, yeah. So if you plug in the power that you want to raise it to, and then hit second e to the power of x, then it just gives you that. You multiply it by your uh, initial value. Excellent, excellent. Very good.
Okay, one thing also I would like to share with you before we go to back, go back to our original discussion. Yeah, let's do this. This is a good one. Actually, there are two good ones here. Okay, the firm sales increased from 20 million to 35 million in three years. What was the average annual growth rate in sales? Okay, so obviously, if you do it, I mean, you just become more comfortable with it. You're going to increase the number of years. Three, your present value is minus 2 million, your future value is plus 35 million. Payments are zero, so you can't in basically the rate of the growth, which is 20.51. Uh, for some of you who like to do this more, more time to become uh, more comfortable with it, you could do it and see if you come up with I'm going to just tell you this. You bought a house in San Diego and you paid $300,000 for it. Okay? So I'm not going to just show you anything, but, but you could remember $300,000. That was nine years ago. Today, they are willing to buy your house for $500,000 after nine years. What is the rate of growth in value of your house? Calculate that. 300,000, nine years ago, is now worth 500,000 after nine years. What is the rate? Anybody come up with it? 5.84. 5.84, that is correct. So this uh, actually is kind of, um, you know, a, a common sense calculation, because you, you know, you, you, we all going to have house, or you will uh, already have house, and the value of your house could go up and down, and 99% is going to go up. <laughs> So you want to calculate, hey, what kind of percentage of growth will you have versus what? Maybe other cities, maybe other states. Hey, the growth in California is like 5.84. What is this growth in Texas? Oh, it's only 1.2%. Oh, 
oh my God, so we live in a neighborhood that increases in value. Therefore, what? Let, let's invest in housing in California rather than Texas. That's your conclusion. Okay, another one. You don't have to do this, but just uh, looking at it, you also could come up with minus, meaning that losing value in percentage. House that was like 247,000, now it's 173,000 after five years. Well, the decline was in 6.87 percentage rate. We uh, get all these. Okay, uh, that's it. That's it on this book. Let's go back to our own uh, slides that we were talking about. This uneven calculation. We already know how to do this. Uh, of course, on this one, you're going to see a lot of exercise in the future when we're going to do certain value, uh, investment valuation. You're going to use this. So, we're going to do a lot of exercise in the future. Therefore, I'm not uh, going to be uh, doing any other one at this time. Okay. The value of lump sum be larger or smaller if the compound is more often holding the uh, stated 1% uh, constant. So meaning, basically, if your compound uh, occurs uh, in more periods, is it larger or smaller? Of course it's larger. Meaning that you, uh, have, uh, you have the rate that is annually compounded. You have to raise that as quarterly compounded, monthly, weekly, daily. So obviously daily compounded is going to be higher. But I want to also let you know something here, that there's a trick here. And the trick is, if you say my money is, uh, or effective annual rate is compounded daily, the difference between annual and daily is not big. Uh, let me just show you, show you what it is. Uh, it's an example. Here, here we go. If your rate is equi uh, or equivalent or effective, both of them are used in uh, finance. So effective annual rate, EAR. If it's compounded, annual rate is 10%. Semi-annually becomes 10.25%. Quarterly becomes 10.38%. I'm going to show you a formula how you calculate all this in just a second, but I have a form here. Monthly, 10.47. Daily, 10.52. Now, this is quite different than somebody comes up and say, hey, this is for credit card that I'm giving you as an interest rate of 1.2 daily percentage. What would be the annual rate on that? Let me see if you calculate that. Hey, I'm saying, hey, this card is uh, charging you 1.2 percent a day. How much is it, Stephen? Yeah, multiplied by 365 annual. What would the annual rate of it? You said 1.25? Yeah. Uh, 456.25? 400 and what? Uh, 56.25. Yeah. So that's the interest that you pay in any. <laughs> 400%. But that is different than what we're talking about. I want you to distinguish the difference. Here we're saying uh, equivalent or uh, uh, effective annual rate that is based on daily calculation. That's different. You see here, difference between annual and daily is only 0.52%, not too much. This is quite different if somebody says, your uh, uh, credit card or whatever is, uh, has 1.2% daily rate, or whatever, 0.5% daily rate, that's what it's called. Because they, the term uh, is uh, 
equivalent uh, annual percentage or effective annual percentage. I just wanted to bring it to your attention because sometimes they do that kind of trick for you. So how do we calculate that? Um, let me give you an example of here. Actually, the formula it is here. If you want to know, let's say if your uh, effective rate is 10% annually, you want to know what is that, let's say, monthly. This is how you do it. You take the annual rate, you take, use this formula. You take by uh, annual rate, say one plus the annual rate, 10%. Divided by, we said what, monthly, right? Divided by 12. Power of 12, minus one gives you the rate. Follow? This is done for semi-annual, I mean, twice a day, twice a year. Semi-annual is minus divided by two, power of two. If I want to do it for quarterly, what number I use? Four. If I want to do it daily, Okay. And they have done it, and this is uh, as a result of that particular uh, 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 percentage rate in um, uh, different intervals. Okay, normally um, effective annual rate is the uh, one that they use. They don't use anything else. Uh, in, uh, and uh, this is it. Uh, if you want to keep the formula with you, or if you want to refer to it, that's your formula. So, future value of your money, if it's 100 bucks, I'm sorry, if present value of money is 100 bucks, and you want to know the future value of it, and it's, in a, uh, and it's uh, basically it's compounded semi annually, instead of annually. You take uh, 100, multiply it with 1, plus 10%, which is the rate, divided by 2, multiply, uh, or, or power of 2 times 3. That is uh, number of uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, semi-annual times what number of the years, whatever the number of years. It, at this, uh, it, this example is 3 years, I guess it says up there. Yeah, 3 years. So two times three. If you want to calculate quarterly, it'd be four here, four times three. Make sense? So far, so on. Uh, so as you can see, uh, here uh, it becomes the answer is uh, $134.01. Okay, so here it goes on the 10% and it's on the quarterly. Okay, if we do this quarterly, meaning that I put them four in here and four in here, it'll be this, Again, if somebody tells you that we have this scenario, a scenario that supposes that we have uh, investment of, um, basically we're saying that we were, we were going to uh, pay $100 for the next three years in uh, obviously present value of it's zero at this time. But the uh, interest that suppose is 10%, not 10.25, 10%. You know how to calculate, right? Hey, 10%, three years, we're gonna give you 100 bucks. What's the future value of that? You could easily calculate, right? However, if they tell you, this is not annual, this is semi-annual. What you wanna do, convert this 10% to the semi-annual terms or percentage, and then put them in here. And that'd be your answer. You follow? So what I want you to do, 
is that calculate this with annual, semi-annual that is here, also monthly. Let's see what happens.
is there any way to see more decimal places, or do you just want to multiply it by 100 to, you know, let me actually, before I ask you, let me try something. Yeah, so I noticed that on these types of calculators, um, it won't, I don't know if you saw that, it only did 0.10, but when I multiply it out, then I could see more of the decimals. I, I didn't know that, sorry. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I guess no it only goes up to right, right. two for the and dollar. And again, if you want to increase your decimal, yeah. this is what you do. Uh, clear all the characters, everything. Okay, second button. Go to decimal, uh, which is, you find the decimal uh, right here. Decimal, right the point. Yeah. Okay. And enter how many number of decimal you want. Let's say four. Push four. Enter. Okay. What does it say? It's 4,000. Clear. Now I see you. Okay. Now you've got four decimal. Okay. Clear this. Oh, clear work. Yeah, clear. Okay. You got, uh, mm. Okay. You got four decimals now. Oh, awesome. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, how about if we uh, calculate the present value? Again, the calculation is simple, folks. Now, of course, in that case, we did the future value. Now we do present value, it is minus 247.59. Okay, the important thing now, that's, that's again, you use that formula, basically, convert your uh, annual to semi-annual, quarterly, whatnot. Now, before we get, uh, adjourn today, tonight, I would like to share this one with you because this is important, especially for your own decision making in the future. Now, let me just set the whole discussion up in this manner. Let's suppose that uh, you bought a house and they give you some uh, effective annual rate. Let's say, hey, uh, you bought a $500,000 home, the rate on this is 5.5% annually and it's 30 years long. Are you interested to know that how much interest you're paying on that home or not? We all do. If within a 30 years, how much interest I pay to banks, then you have to put amortization table together to come up with it. It's very simple. I have done it in my, house, oh, my own uh, house. So I'm going to show you how to put amortization table. Now, what are the benefits of it? Well, one simple benefit of it, you know, hey, how much interest I pay? And you're going to be shocked, by the way, or surprised. That in most cases, you pay more than the price of the house as interest to bank if your loan is like 30 years. Do it, and you're going to see it. However, the other benefits of it that is even more important but then let's suppose your house is 30 years long. And then uh, after about 12 years of payment toward your house, somebody walks up to you and says, hey, what is your interest rate? And you say 5.5. Would you like to refinance this 4.5? I'll give you a better deal. Would you refinance it or not? That's a good question, huh? Take a look at the amortization table, and then you have a better judgment. Why? because you're going to find out that 75% of all the payment that you paid in the last 12 years went toward your interest alone. So you want to start all over again? Really? Because of 1%? That's silly. You better think again. So, yeah, I'm out there to people who provide you all this knowledge to make better decisions, basically. And then again, you're going to be thinking about it. Oh, if I want to refinance my house, what is good year to do it? Meaning that after how many years does it make sense to do it? You're going to say, yeah, if you do it for the first five years, it makes sense. Meaning that 1% is going to make the difference. Meaning that you're ahead. You're going to say up to two years, 2% maybe, or 2.5% is going to make sense. 
after up to 15 years, going to say, no, 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 I cannot define as my house unless the difference is like three and a half or four percent. You see what I'm getting at? Not that those my my figures are exact in numbers, but I'm just giving you the idea. What, how you want to read that, how you want to make your decision. Almost no loans after 15 years should be refinanced because they're not going to give you like 8% difference between your existing loan and what they're offering as almost impossible. You follow? So after 12 years, or especially even longer, longer than that, never ever refinance your house. Because you're going to end up losing. So. And you could easily do this for your own hands. This is how it works. This is a simple example. This is a small table, gives you the idea, but for your own home, if it's like 15 years or 30 years, with um, bigger figures, of course, 500,000, 1 million, or whatever. Of course, your table is going to be uh, long, and you need to spend, um, I don't know, maybe uh, another 10, 15 minutes on it. It's not that simple, but that's okay. This example is, let's say, we're going to put together an amortization schedule for $1,000, 10% annual loan for three equal payments. Let's suppose this is a scenario, you go to a furniture store and you like a furniture, and say, how much? It says 1,000. Say, hey, I don't have any money. Can you finance it? Sure. Your annual rate is gonna be 10%, and uh, within th uh, I'm gonna be uh, finance you for three years. So basically, you're gonna pay, make payments every month for three years till you pay off your 1,000, the 10% annual rate. How much that individual should be paying every month to this uh, particular furniture store? Calculate. You, should, you know how to do it. So here your future value is what? 1,000. Future value is what here? Zero. Because you're going to end up paying everything. There is no future value here. You have present value, which is what? Minus 1,000. Your rate is 10%. In is 3. PMT is what you're after. You already forgot what you need to do? You already got that, 404.02.11, right? That's your annual. Do it uh, monthly. So basically divide that 402 by 12, that's what it is. So how much are you going to pay monthly? 33.5. How much? About 33.50. 33.50, yeah, you're gonna pay $33.50 for three years to pay your $1,000 loan with 10%. Everybody come up with those numbers? Yes, please, yeah? Okay, good. Now, when you do that, your amortization table normally is for annual, so we're gonna use this 402, not that 33. But, but that basically gives you an idea that how much a month, a month of payment you will have. So we're gonna go for, start from beginning balance. We're gonna say, hey, how much was on my balance? 1,000. The interest on it is how much? Well, 10% of that, right? So $100 I'm gonna pay interest. Wait a second, how much payment I'm gonna make? 
Well, your payment was four, what is it? 402. But hundred dollars is the interest, isn't it? Yeah. So deduct hundred from 402. How much are you gonna have? 302. That's your balance transferred to following year. Make sense? And again, the following year, you're going to say, hey, what is it, 10% uh, of this $302 that I owe? Oh, it's like uh, $30. Okay, how much I'm paying? 402 Deduct that $30 from it. The balance goes again to what? Your next year. So look at this. Now, payment, 402 minus 100 302 That's your next year's balance. Again, you're going to take 302 out of where, it's not balanced, I'm sorry. So you're going to say, hey, this is uh, how much I pay, it's going to be applied toward my principal, right? So basically, $100 is interest, 302 is going to apply toward your principal. So 1,000 minus 302, 697 is your balance, going to go to next year. So next year, when you have 698 as your beginning balance, how much is your payment? 402. How much was interest on this? Well, $69.80, but let's say $70. So $70 minus 402 is going to give you, what, 332. That is going to be applied, I'm sorry, that's going to be principal, uh, yeah, principal applied toward you what? Your 1,000 or your loan. So uh, 332 minus your beginning balance, is going to give you a balance of 366 for the following year. What's the interest on it? 36 bucks. 36 minus 402 is 366. It's going to apply toward your principal and zero is going to be your end balance, obviously. That's how you're going to put your uh, amortization table. However, what are the revealing facts here? Wait a second, how much I paid to this guy? Well, you paid total $1,206. Okay, $1,000 was the price of the furniture, so I paid $206 as interest in three years? Yep. Okay. Now, here is, like I said, simple example to give you how to calculate that. But when you put this one for 30 years in your house, this particular calculation, that many thinking there is going to give you some clues as to what your decision should be. And then you could manipulate that by even coming up with the percentages. It's like, okay, after this particular year of, let's say, 12 years, 13 years, what percentage of my total loan has been paid in interest is there for you? That's, that's so revealing that you know that, hey, my God, in the first 10 years of my loan, 80% of what I paid went toward interest. Yeah. <laughs> so that gets, prompts you to make better decisions. What do you want to do now? You want to refinance it, remodify it, whatever? Any questions on this one? So I, I don't want to give this as an assignment to you because some of you may not have house yet, but think about it that if you want to buy a house, don't forget the uh, opportunity to put the amortization table for your own house. As a matter of fact, if you ask banker, it would, they would give it to you if you want it. But it's something very important. But you know how to, to put it together yourself, to be honest with you. So I did myself my own long, long time ago. It didn't take more than half an hour. OK, all right. So interest paid declines with each payment as balance declines. So this is a graphical depiction of it. You see that uh, the light blue is your interest, the uh, dark blue is your principal. In as uh, time goes by, your um, uh, principal increases and your interest decreases. And that's it. Okay. We covered only one chapter, folks. <laughs> That's okay, because it's a good one, uh, important one that we need to spend some time on. 
Any, any questions? Do you want to do some exercises on, um, on some of the things that we did, like on event calculation? Or do you want me to go to a different topic or start a different topic? Because this is interesting. It's also it's very much connected to our discussion on bonds and bond valuation. Uh, so we need to uh, know what it is before we analyze the bond. But as far as your present value and future value, are you comfortable with the calculations? Yeah? How about uneven bonds? The ones that I said arrow up, arrow down. You want to do some of those or you're okay with there? I need I know you're very excited, but calm down and answer. <laughs> all right, no, okay. So you're all okay? Should I move in here? Okay. All right. Interesting. Let me begin with asking you a couple of questions. Let's suppose I'm a banker. Let's suppose you're a major company, like Qualcomm, and I'm a banker in San Diego. You come to me and say, hey, Dan, um, I need one billion dollar. OK. What are, what's the process here? What, what are the things that needs to be taking place? OK, I said, yes, I'll give you one billion. Do I have one billion in my reserve in my bank? 99.9% of the time, no. Why not? Because banks do not keep money in their wallet beyond the required reserve ratio of the Federal Reserve. Meaning that if Federal Reserve says you're required to put only 15% of what you receive from us in your wallet, in your safe and loan out the rest, I'll be silly to put in there 25% and the loan out the rest because I'm not going to make money. If the money sitting in my wallet is not making money, follow me? Okay. Normally what they do is they borrow from Federal Reserve. When they borrow from Federal Reserve, therefore the, um, the rate, Federal Funds rate, which is the base rate, for all the banking system that is set by Federal Reserve, Federal Reserve, uh, you, you guys know what it is, right? We talked about it now with the class. Uh, to have the rates, meaning that normally, right now, uh, uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure that you're here with the news that uh, Federal Reserve wants to um, uh, keep the same, the uh, rates the same. Uh, Mr. Trump is saying no, it should, should drop, and all these discussions is about all these because they're extremely important. So, federal funds is going to be important to me as a bank because I'm borrowing this money from Federal Reserve. What kind of rate they're going to be charging me? What else I have to think about? This is my question here. Okay, I'm a bank, Bank of America, I'm giving you one billion dollars. Okay, federal funds is one of the rates that I should be including in my rate when I charge you as interest. What else I need to include in there? Is that it? Meaning that whatever the Federal Reserve is charging me, I'm going to charge you. <coughs> if I do that, I'm not making any money. I'll be out of business in no time. So what I should include in that particular interstate calculation? You should know. You should know. Did we talk about inflation? Yes, we did. Is inflation is going to happen? Well, it doesn't matter. You federal government, Qualcomm, or Sony, or whoever, inflation is going to impact you. It has nothing to do with industry, country, or the kind of company. Inflation is going to happen. Okay, I'm going to include inflation in there. I know inflation is going to happen. What percentage I should include in my interest rate beside the federal funds rate? The inflation rate? Hmm? The inflation rate? Yeah. yeah. What is it? I'm, I'm giving you loan right now. Mm -hmm. It's not passed. Yeah, passed. I know hey, last year was 2.5, the prior year was 2.6. But in the future, I'm giving you the money. How can I calculate 
inflation and my interest rate that I'm giving you loan for the next 30 years? That's, that is my question. How, how, do, how do we do that? Have you thought about it? Studying bond yield curves. That's the bond yield curve. What includes in bond yield curve? Uh, the price of usually like treasury bills, T notes, and treasury Not bonds. Not but bills, short uh, bills or bonds. Short, yeah, short term bonds. Okay. Yeah. And. Okay, don't let that you know. All right, that's exactly what it is, but I'm gonna to add to it. Inflation is one of them, okay? So a combination of the inflation with federal funds rate, or the opportunity cost of money we refer to, is called risk-free rate. What is risk-free rate? Treasury bill, short-term treasury bond. Okay. So am I saying that that inflation rate is known? Yeah, it is. How? Federal Reserve forecast that for you. For how long? For only five years. So you could be confident using the federal funds uh, or, or, or treasury bond, let's say, or uh, short-term treasury bond or treasury bill rate as your risk free rate. Can I uh, calculate the inflation myself? Yes, you can. Take a look at what the prediction of the Federal Reserve or forecast of Federal Reserve is for inflation for the next five years. Wait a second, now, my loan is for 30 years. This is five years. Yeah, so what am I gonna do? What do you think I should do? Forecast this for five years. I'm loaning out uh, Josh for 30 years. What I need to do here? Multiply by six. Multiply by six. Oh, you're not going to borrow that money. <laughs> Say, are you crazy? <laughs> Folks, I'm going to tell them, I'll give you the money, and this is the rate. But your loan is renegotiable every five years. Am I making sense? After five years, come here. I already included 3% inflation. But after five, oh, and that's what Federal Reserve told us. But after five years, is it going to be 3% higher or lower? Actually, if it's lower, it's going to get a good deal. Just follow what I'm getting at? What is this? I'm basically hedging my risk. I'm minimizing or mitigating my risk by doing so. So let's go back to our interest rate. Beside risk-free rate, which includes what? the opportunity cost or uh, federal funds rate plus inflation rate. That's your risk rate. rate. I'm gonna show you the formula, don't worry about it. What else is there as a risk for me? It's not there, my inflation is not there. But also the risks are associated with my uh, money or, or, or loan. Default? People, what about people? The other guy not, not being able to make the payments at all? Yeah. yeah, default risk, right? So default risk is another default risk premium, what we refer to, is a percentage that you put on top of the loan if you know that individual is not a prime borrower, meaning what? He may fail to pay you. We include another percentage in what else is there? Okay, there are two other items in there. One is called liquidity premium, and the other one is called maturity risk premium. Maturity risk premium basically is about uh, length of your loan. If it is for a long time, obviously it's more riskier. Why? Because you don't know what's going to be happening 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now. Interest rates are going to be changing, the economy is going to be changing, many things are going to happen. So your money that you loan out is exposed to many other variables, risk factors, versus if it was what? Short term. 
And the other one, liquidity premium is the cash flow of the borrower. How rich cash flow or how poor cash flow you are, are you in borrowing money? Why that is important? Well, that is important is that I'm going to give you two examples. Did you guys know that many of the uh, royal families of many of these countries that have the uh, let's say constitutional monarchy or whatnot, like England, like uh, Holland, like uh, many of the countries around the world. Did you know that these guys uh, are in, financially they're in trouble? Did you know that? You know why? Because they have billions of dollars of assets, like castles, this, that, 10 Rolls Royce and all these things. But nobody's working. There is no cash flow coming in. You follow? I mean, you've got to maintain all those. How much is your electricity bill? Oh, about $10,000 a year. Where are you going to get the money from? Meaning that many, not all of them, many of them do have cash flow issues. Therefore, they sell their estates to survive. Meaning that you don't have people working and, and gaining the money, earning money every month. If all those are all you know, prince and princess and all these things, they're having fun. But I don't. So, cash flow. Many of the castles are being sold. Why did they sell their castle? Well, they don't have the money to keep it. <clears throat> another reason, another example is, I think I mentioned this one. Dealerships. It's a good prime example. Hey, I have $50 million of assets sitting in there, brand new Mercedes Benz. Well, what, have you sold any of them? No. Well, you're in trouble. I mean, they don't have cash flow. Cash flow is very important in the world of business. You don't have cash flow, you're going to get in trouble. I don't care how much asset you have. I, I don't care actually how much profitable you are. Oh, we're not the profitable company in the world. Okay, what is your cash flow status? Oh, we don't have a dime to pay even on a Saturday. Jesus Christ, you have a business. So, that's called liquidity and risk of liquidity. Many people, many companies uh, do not have ability to liquidate their asset to pay their obligations, okay? So, including all these premiums, premiums here means risk. Including all these premiums, we could construct our interest rates. Now, banks do have also method of using this, but this is a structure of the interest rates primarily is uh, put together for what? Bond. Bonds. When you issue bonds, you want to know what kind of coupon rate you have to put on your bond. Now, bond yield curve is a curve that you construct based on all these premiums, all these risks, which I'm going to show you uh, how it looks. Okay? Now, we're going to talk about bond next week, and you're going to see how important this interest rate and calculation of interest rate is in putting your, uh, putting your uh, bond yield curve in uh, how you calculate what's going to be your coupon rate. And you're going to understand that coupon rate is different than interest rate of the bond. What is coupon rate? Is that based on coupon rate, you're going to pay the payments. And that is based on that formula that we use to come up with your interest rate. You follow? You're going to say, hey, this bond has coupon rate of 10%. Where'd you get that 10% from bond yield curve? That's why you, 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 you're going to calculate all these. However, total rate of return of your bond within the uh, date of the maturity or within the years that till the date of maturity is different rate. has nothing to do with your coupon rate. It could be higher, lower, or whatnot. For now, how much time we got? Yeah, I got ten minutes to just show you a couple of things, and then we'll continue on on this discussion. There's two things here. There are two things here that we have to understand. 
One is level of interest rates, the other one is structure of interest rates, okay? So I'm gonna put it on the board what I mean. The structure of the interest rates are if this is R is equal to R star, which is the federal funds rate, or uh, in, uh, option cost of money, plus IP, inflation premium, plus uh, default risk premium, plus liquidity premium, plus maturity risk premium. That's your structure of your interest rate. So let's suppose if your structure of interest rate is this, also there's another phenomenon that we call level of interest rate. The whole thing could go up, also could go down, you follow? The factors that impact in the fluctuation of up and down are outside of this. Well, it's not outside, but influenced by outside elements, like what? When the Federal Reserve, Drops the rate, guess what? The whole thing comes down. Federal Reserve increased rate, this whole thing goes up. Mainly because of this uh, R star and IP. So, my point of saying this is when somebody says level of interest rates, is that how high or low it is versus the structure of interest rate that includes all these components. Follow? And the level of the, like I said, level of the interest states are um, many things, production opportunity, time preference of consumption, risk, expected inflation, so forth, so on. Okay, the way, okay, here, these two, remember that I said earlier, in inflation premium plus the opportunity cost of money or the federal funds rate, Together is called risk free. Right. So when it, and our or, this is the sign of it, R, R, F. Whenever you see R, R, F, it means this money is risk free. What is risk free? Free of all these risks, except for inflation. Why? Inflation doesn't. Discriminate inflation will happen regardless of who you are, where you are, what company you are, what country you are. So inflation is going to be for everybody. But if the, uh, we have absence of other uh, risks, we say, well, this is what? Risk free. Which what uh, Charles said earlier is equal to, it's always no, equal to what? Treasury bills or short term treasury bond. So you always know what it is. Am I making sense? And why those are the ones? Because government doesn't face none of these problems. Government is not going to run it on. Government is not going to default your money. So government doesn't have liquidity problem per year. You follow? And for also maturity risk, yeah, exists only in long-term treasury bonds, not in short-term. And no, not in treasury bills because they are short term, so they don't have them. Okay? All right. Bear in mind, this discussion is only for next week because we're going to talk about the next discussion the guys for bond. But what we did prior to this, those are going to be more important in our future discussions how you calculate net present value, what is the future value of this, how you can come up with some of these calculations to value to investment and so forth, so on. Okay, so therefore, your final, uh, at this time, the final determination of interest rate equal to what I put on the board, which basically is the required rate of return of or R, is equal to risk-free rate of interest, uh, the real risk rate of a uh, real, bear in mind, there is a two, two terms here. One is real risk-free rate, the other one is just risk-free rate. 
Refresh rate H is R star plus IP. Follow? But the real risk free is just R star, meaning that uh, a money that even doesn't include inflation, which is almost impossible. But it's the term we use for R star, which some people refer to it as official cost of money, some people could refer to it as federal funds rate, and many other things. Base rate, if you will. DRP, default uh, risk premium, liquidity premium, margin maturity risk premium, we talked about all this. Now, when we talk about the bonds next week, you're going to see that there is different uh, risk associated with each of these uh, particular uh, uh, bonds. Short-term treasury bonds do have only one risk, and that's the inflation premium, like I said earlier. They don't have maturity risk premium, they no the default, no liquidity. Long-term treasury is only IP plus maturity risk premium, which is not very significant. You're going to see next week when we calculate all these. Maturity risk is a very small percentage, but we should include it when we're talking about long-term treasury bonds. Short-term corporate bonds includes inflation premium, default risk premium, and liquidity premium. But they don't have maturity risk because they are short-term. However, long-term corporate bonds include all of them. Inflation uh, premium, maturity risk premium, default risk premium, and liquidity premium. Okay. One question, and we're going to go home. We're going to continue this next week. Therefore, don't you conclude that corporate, long-term corporate bonds should have higher uh, rate of return? Because huh? it includes what? Mm. Higher interest rates. High risk, what? High risk. That's why if you want to buy treasury uh, bond versus corporate bond, long-term corporate bond, bear in mind, you're going to get rich here, but also you're going to lose your shirt here. Watch out. <laughs> versus treasury bond, you have no risk associated with that. But rate of return on it is not going to make you a millionaire. I'm going to stop here. Any questions about all the things that we talked about? Bear in mind, we're going to, again, bring your cash. Don't ever forget your calculator. From this point on, we're going to use your calculator in many, many different calculations, okay? And we're going to put a lot of emphasis on future value, present value, net present value discussions, okay? Any questions, any comments? How about a question that shall we go home? The answer is? Yeah. 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 Sure. Let's do it. Have a good night.